Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea, we also take a look at some of the equipment used to replicate volcanic reactions inside the laboratory at the University of Hawaii Center for Volcanology on Oahu. And volcanoes are happening in the upper part of the Earth's crust. Right, so the, the volcano is really just an edifice. It's an outpouring of previous uh, melting activity and, and eruption activity. And then the conduit, or what we call the plumbing system, goes down several kilometers, so maybe eight to 10 kilometers in the Earth's crust. Um, maybe deeper, depending on which part of the crust you're talking about and what it's made out of. And how hot is um, the magma inside of a volcano? Well, it depends on its composition. So if it's a high silica composition, the temperature might be uh, between 800 and 900, 950 degrees C. Um, if it's a basalt, then it'll be 1150 to 1250 degrees C. So with this apparatus, we can, we can generate pressures up to about 300 megapascals, which is about 3,000 times atmospheric pressure, which takes us significantly down into the Earth's crust. Um, doesn't get us to the mantle, so we're not studying deep earth processes. We're studying the processes that are relevant to volcanic eruptions. I'm interested to hear what you're studying um, in the lab, Tom. Okay, well, um, so uh, I don't know if she pronounced the word furnace. That's, that's <laughs> what do we call our ovens, <laughs> that's, uh, the technical term for them. Um, basically, what I, I study is um, the crystallization of magma, at least with Julia here. And um, this is something that, that has to do, um, you know that magma is usually considered molten uh, at depth. And um, what one of the things we try to, um, to do when we study uh, volcanic rocks and magmas is see what are the conditions at which these magmas crystallize and to what extent they crystallize. So for example, if you pick up a rock at the surface, and you try to look with um, hand lens or something, you'll see all these you know, tiny, tiny crystals, sometimes a little bigger. Um, and so we can take some of that, that uh, materials that we pick up at the surface, and she probably explained that already, but uh, we, we put those in these uh, capsules. We enclose a little piece of rock w within a capsule, and we can put those in, um, in these pressure vessels. Uh, and so um, our um, our objective is to try and um, see if we can, for one thing, replicate some of these um, uh, crystal textures that we observe in, on, in the rocks at the surface. Um, and the other thing is uh, more the purely uh, research side of um, how these, these crystals form, the speed at which they form in the magma and everything. So. Um, this is the real volcanology aspect of what, what I do uh, and then trying to, um, uh, to do this because basically uh, these are one of the most common types of, of uh, rocks that you find around the Pacific Ring of Fire. You also find them, of course, here in Hawaii, um, you know, the uh, Kilauea volcano. And uh, so we're really entering into this, this, um, this uh, uh, phase right now where we have uh, the materials that we need to really be able to investigate um, processes like crystallization uh, of magma. So in detail, what, what do I do with, uh, with uh, these, these pressure vessels? So um, I, I'll have a capsule in which I have my sample. It's completely uh, welded top and bottom. So this is an example. Um, tiny little capsule, usually we use these precious metals, um, and we weld them at the bottom, and after we put the sample in them, we weld them at the top. Uh, we also put some uh, volatile phase because a lot of that magma actually contains uh, volatiles such as water, um, sulfur, di uh, carbon dioxide. Um, By a volatile, you mean something that can turn into a gas. Exactly, yes. Uh, so. Um, these that are usually, we, we use the term dissolved, that just means that the molecules of water, CO2 and all that, um, are kind of um, distributed within the, the magma, within the melt phase, but as you uh, change the conditions, so for example, magma that is ascending towards the surf surface, uh, you will usually change the pressure, you decrease uh -huh, the pressure. Uh -huh. 
and just like uh, opening a, a Coke can or bottle will will uh, tend to uh, generate uh, X solution of these bubbles and this is why before you open the bottle nothing happens um, it same happens with magma as we uh, decrease the pressure as magma rises we exolve uh, these bubbles and and those are pretty interesting too in the uh, in the context of um, other people that uh, study uh, undersea uh, all the underwater biologists are pretty interested by um, by these volatiles because there's uh, this constant degassing on the on the seafloor mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of these gases that escape not necessarily uh, with magma but uh, these um, contribute to uh, to produce producing this pretty complex ecosystems that a lot of the uh, the marine biologists uh, study so um, you know all the, of course all these things are kind of uh, go all together in trying to un understand um, uh, I mean our point of view is the uh, magma is the um, the crystals the gases um, and but we uh, often work hand in hand with uh, marine biologists because this is a uh, some some uh, uh, of course topic that they're deeply interested in um, so if I go back to uh, my little capsule um, it'll be inserted within this pressure vessel uh -huh. so this is just a um, a kind of a fancy metal alloy that resists pretty high temperatures um, and you can actually you can actually see that uh, from the top to the bottom it actually looks a little thinner at the bottom oh you're right and this is uh, this is because we it is subject to to pretty intense heat so I I, um, I will I usually put this vessel in the furnace maybe at about a thousand degrees or more Celsius um, and what happens is that these temperatures, um, the, uh, the the metals will will tend to not only oxidize but you know progressively be um, eroded from the vessel. So this is just a testament to. The so it started off uniformly. Exactly, in it diameter. all started off at this color and this this type of material. Wow. Um, yeah, and and this is a. Um, what I call this the sheath, the actual vessel. So this is a protection for the actual vessel which is inside. And this one is probably less than one year old. So it's, uh, I don't know how many experiments I, I did in, in theirs, but this is uh, the, uh, the main vessel in which I just inserted the capsule. So the capsule is sitting here at the bottom. We have a protective sheath around it because the vessel is quite expensive <laughs> um, and we want it to be able to last as long as possible so basically if um, here in my furnace I take this little cap off and actually oh. you can see it's it's glowing um, right now it's at close to a thousand degrees it's it's pretty hot um, and um, I can insert this this vessel in, into the furnace and put my sample at about a thousand degrees so I'm not gonna do this this now because um, I also need to have some running water on the top part so that it doesn't overheat so um, it's just technical but uh, basically the uh, next thing that we'll do so I think Julia also spoke about um, how uh, we need to uh, be able to pressurize our experiments in the lab if we want to replicate magmas there at sitting at depth mm -hmm. so um, the you know the deeper you go uh, within the crust, the more you're subject to a higher higher pressures. Um, and to do this here, we uh, we use these gas pressurizing lines. So this we can attach to the top of the furnace. Again, I'm not I'm not gonna do this now because I have no no experiments running. <laughs> but um, uh, this little uh, alloy tube uh, can withstand pretty high pressures, and so that so does the vessel. So we can. Um, we can go up to, I'd say probably, easily 200 megapascals at these temperatures, and this translated into amounts of earth crust on top of you is probably um, you would be sitting under eight kilometers of of earth crust. So, um, what what is to get from all this is that basically we we can study these um, these processes that occur um, from pretty deep to the up to the surface, and we. Um, and my experiments consist in uh, varying some of these conditions like pressure or temperature and seeing how my crystals form and to what extent they form, their shapes, um, also their chemical 
um, sort of characteristics, so they're, you know, major element chemistry. Um, and by comparing this with natural samples that you, um, that you pick uh -huh. at the surface, um, there you can make a lot of inferences as to what um, was the style of magma ascent and eruption at a certain location. So I was speaking about the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, but people have done this for Hawaii, for example, at least, you know, trying to, um, um, uh, to cool down magma within experiments and try to uh, see how well it matches uh, samples that you would pick up here on the Big Island of Hawaii, for example. So it's a really w pretty wide range of applications and, um, and, and that's good because there's a pretty wide range of volcanic um, type of eruptions and activity. Is there any uh, applied use of the research that, um, in other words, not it's useful for our understanding. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other practical implications of why we would need to know what conditions caused the volcanic islands to form or certain crystals? Mm -hmm. Well, um, for us, I mean, the uh, one of the the major reasons to try and you know understand this, and I talked about picking rocks and trying to recreate their histories. Uh -huh. um, I think one of the important components is the, the uh, we always say in geology, the key to understanding the, and understanding, uh, the future is always trying to look at the past and you know, biologists also do, do the same, same things, but uh, when they work maybe uh, more uh, with um, paleontologists and things like that. Um, and so for us, this is kind of the, um, you know, a holy grail is trying to really be able to predict the future behavior of um, uh, basically uh, volcanic regions, um, trying to predict what kind of eruptions uh, yeah. we will get. So whether uh, we're talking about volcanoes that are on the seafloor at high depths, and these usually are less of a problem in terms of human uh, settlements. Um, but uh, as you know, the Pacific Ring of Fire is quite a—it's um, a place that's quite inhabited. There's, there's a, you know, from everywhere, from Japan uh, to um, to the U.S. mainland to South America, and and those are hazards-wise. This is a pretty important uh, implication uh, of our work. So we we um, we try to generalize what we do here and our experiments to try and really. Um, yeah, understand what could happen in the future at certain locations. Um, yeah. Can you explain to me the ring of fire? What do you mean when you say that? Oh, uh, so the the ring of fire is um, uh, is this whole zone around the Pacific, um, and that extends. So most people know the um, the Cascade volcanoes in the mainland. Um, uh, if you go down the mainland, you go into Mexico, this chain of volcano actually continues. Uh, it crosses through Central America, goes down and in, in South America, and it's, um, we call them all different volcanic chains, but in fact, they're all part of this, this uh, um, really huge tectonic process that is, um, that is occurring all around the Pacific, which is a subduction of plates, uh, one underneath the other. And um, and uh, well, after South America, then you uh, you you continue um, you c you continue further to the uh, west side of the Pacific. You have uh, Japan um, and uh, Kam Kamchatka in Russia. So th this whole zone that is um, uh, that has these mountain mountain chains that are mostly made of volcanoes. Um, we talk about the Pacific Ring of Fire, and this is just to. Um, to highlight the fact that uh, th these are all volcanoes, all prone to um, being active and having eruptions. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, Improving Schools, Improving Education, CRDG. NOAA Pacific Services Center, linking people to information and technology.
The Pacific Services Center wants you to be prepared for any weather emergency and know your tsunami risk. NOAA Pacific Services Center, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. <laughs>